Il professor Ian Wilmot è il, lo scienziato responsabile dell'esperimento che portò alla clonazione di Dolly. Questo esperimento è importantissimo perché fino ad allora si riteneva impossibile produrre un organismo completo da una cellula differenziata. Quindi è uno degli esperimenti più importanti del, in biologia del XX secolo. Però la lettura andrà oltre questo risultato straordinario e discuterà come sulla base di, del, del successo con la clonazione di Dolly sia stato possibile concepire nuove tecniche per riprogrammare le cellule dell'organismo e utilizzare queste cellule riprogrammate per la terapia in medicina, soprattutto di patologie molto gravi. Thank you very much indeed, Chancellor and colleagues, for that very generous introduction and your very warm welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here, to have the opportunity to talk to you about science. Where did the Dolly experiment come from? What was it that over a period of more than 100 years led to the development of this approach of research? And most importantly, what doors has it opened for us all? Because there are several which I think are quite important. So I shall be talking to you about cloning in the frog, as well as producing Dolly. And the fact that, as was mentioned already, the birth of Dolly led to a lot of us thinking rather differently about cells and wondering if we could change them from one cell type to another. And on the top right here, we have a photograph of Shinya Yamanaka, who with his postdoc colleague uh, Takahashi, was the first to really achieve that objective and to produce a method which reliably changes cells from one type to another. And in the bottom two pictures, you see a picture of a, pa a patient affected by a cruel disease, motor neuron disease, and on the left, a representation of the hope that before too long, possibly our group or possibly other groups around the world will be looking for medicines for small molecules which if given to patients with that disease will slow down their progression. A small molecule like that is not likely to repair the damage but it would be a very significant step forward if we could simply stop the circumstances getting any worse. I'll come back to this disease a little later on but whilst her picture is there I'll mention that the lady has lost the use of her legs, probably her arms, and she's been, having, she's been artificially ventilated because she can't breathe anymore. A, a very cruel situation to be in for a young mother or anybody else. It's also important to recognize that it's very, very unusual for one person to do experiments all on their own these days. And this area of research involved at least twice as many people as are shown in this particular photograph here. But just to acknowledge before we go any further that on the right there, with a, a halo just uh, put round his head, is Keith Campbell, who put in a lot of the basic cell biology which enabled us to take this step forward. And on the left, Lorraine Young is a postdoc who carried out investigations later on to try and understand why the technique is so inefficient. Many of you will remember that we only had one lamb from 270 attempts. Lorraine and others have looked at embryos to try and find out what happened in the other uh, cases. But I want to start by going back to the 19th century and pointing out the original reason why people began to think about what we now think of as cloning or nuclear transfer. You have to cast away a lot of the current knowledge, excuse me, cast away a lot of the current knowledge. There was a concept of genes of genetics, but no knowledge, of course, of DNA or of actual individual gene structure. There was obviously a context of inheritance, because you know, we all know that members of a family tend to have some similarities but none of the basic modern knowledge was there. And they began asking the question to a really quite startling observation which still goes on every day. How is it that complex bodies like ourselves all form 
from a single cell. And one of the ideas that emerged at that time was that maybe the genetic information was not divided equally when the cells divided. So the reason why one cell became muscle was because it has the genetic instructions for muscle, but no longer has the instructions for nerves or blood or any of the other tissues. And that was quite a prevalent concept around that time, led by a German scientist, uh, Weissmann. And it occurred to people that one intellectually simple way of testing that hypothesis would be to take a cell from an adult and see if its genetic information was still capable of producing another adult. Because if that was true, then clearly every cell had got all of the genetic information and the hypothesis was not true. So that, for a hundred years or so, was the reason why people began to think about this sort of experiment. No concept at all of livestock breeding or copying pets or cloning people, just simply to ask a basic biological question. It led on, as we've already heard, to, to the question, well, if they do have all of the genetic information, can we change cells from one type to another? So let's just consider in a little bit of detail what we mean by nuclear transfer. And I'm going to use the situation, the approach that we use for cloning mammals. When you need two cells, one of which is an egg recovered from a female shortly after it's been ovulated. And at that time, in most animals, certainly in the sheep, the chromosomes which remain in the egg are all grouped together near to the surface of the egg alongside a small body which has got some of the chromosomes in. Remember, meiosis involves throwing out some of the chromosomes to reduce chromosome number. And, and those that are discarded are in that first polar body. And it's very clear that, that the chromosomes inside the cell will be quite close to that because it wasn't long before that there was a spindle joining the two together. And the first thing that happens is that a pipette is used to remove those before the same pipette is then used to place the cell which is going to provide the new genetic information into this space here. Mammalian eggs have a shell. It's not hard like a chicken's shell. It's, it's rather rubbery, but nonetheless there is a shell, so the pipette has to go through that and then deposit the cell in the space. In our technique, we use an electric current to do two things, to fuse these two things together so that the genetics, the chromosomes are introduced into the egg and also to stimulate the egg to begin development. If you think back a little bit to meiosis, what happens if an egg is shed and then fertilized is that the, the sperm may arrive and bring in the other half of the chromosomes and stimulate the egg to begin development. So really the electric current that we apply here does these two things. It introduces the genetic information from the donor cell and it stimulates the egg to begin development. Our objective in starting this research was primarily to be able to make genetic changes in animals because whilst you have the cells in the lab, it was already possible in the 1980s to think of using standard molecular biology techniques to make precise changes in the chromosomes in those cells. And if you did that, you would end up with an animal which was like the, uh, the original donor of the cells, except for the precise change that you had made. When we started the research, there was no way of making precise change to the genetics of an animal like the sheep. So that was actually our aim in starting this research. So just to show you what this looks like down a, a microscope, it's a little bit like playing with a, um, a computer game because you have two joysticks controlling things. The one on the left will control the biggest pipette which you'll see in a minute being used to pick up one of these eggs. And the one on the right will move the smaller of the two pipettes, which will make the changes. And in order to be able to achieve this, there is a pipette attached to this left-hand pipette, which applies suction. You can see that this egg is being held in place. So once Bill, our, our technician who did all this work, 
picked up the egg, he would then ch change hands and get the, the joystick on the right uh, in order to ma manipulate this finer pipette and the syringe on the left in order to be able to, to apply suction. This is the polar body that I mentioned. So he's picking up cytoplasm near to that polar body and the polar body itself. The egg has been incubated with a dye which binds to DNA and fluoresces. So the egg has been taken out of the field of view and a blue light has been turned on and you're expecting to see two groups of chromosomes fluorescing. One being the polar body and the other being the second metaphyte phase. And that's probably the way around that they are because there'll be more DNA in the polar body. If you don't see the two, then you either have to discard the egg or try again. These are cells, I've actually forgotten exactly what they are, but they're probably skin cells um, which have been grown in culture. And you can see straight away that they are much smaller than the egg, because this magnification is similar and this pipette is the same one that you saw being used a few minutes ago. So you can aspirate an entire cell into the pipette. Bill had a routine of working with a dozen or so eggs, which is why you saw him picking up a, a number of cells. I hope that you can s still see that there is a cell just here in the pipette. And what you're going to see is he passes the pipette through that shell, and it's not very clear, so I'm sure you won't be able to see from the back. But the cell is going to be placed in the space. I mentioned that we use an electric current to fuse the two cells together, and that will only happen if they're touching which is why the last thing that you'll see him do is just gently to press them together in the hope of increasing the, the contact between the two cells. So a cell just going into the space, sitting just there in the gap. So that's all there is to it. Now in fact, although I've shown you a picture of nuclear transfer in mammals, the earlier work was done in amphibians, initially in the United States by Briggs and King working with one species of amphibian, and then more recently by John Gurdon working in England. And this is a photograph, a classic photograph from one of his papers. Briggs and King initially demonstrated that it was possible to get offspring if he transferred the nuclei from very early embryos. John Gurdon took that process a lot further, and you can see at the bottom here that there is a, a graph showing the stages from which nuclei were, were transferred. Um, this is his line for amphibians, this is ours for, for sheep. And you can see in both cases that there is a drop in efficiency as cells were taken from later stages. And it wasn't clear initially, for, in the time of Briggs and King certainly, whether this was because some of the cells had lost DNA, the original hypothesis, or more likely that the mechanisms which were controlling development in those cells were perhaps so complex and so rigidly fixed that the process of nuclear transfer was not reprogramming them. So the striking limitation for the amphibian work was that although there were adults if nuclei were taken from tadpoles and tadpoles if the nuclei were taken from adults, there has never been an adult clone of an adult frog. So it is complex to explain. If John Gurdon was here, what he would say is that all of these cells at all stages probably have all of the DNA. There are, of course, lots of other pieces of information that suggest that. But from the tadpoles, he could take cells from differentiated tissue and get ad adults. So it's very likely that all of the DNA is there and it was possible to reprogram it. But there is something different about the biology of cells from adults in the context of very early development. And the most likely explanation is that in the adults, the cell cycle is very long in comparative terms, whereas in the early embryo, it's very short. And that the, the nuclei from the adults were simply unable to accelerate to get up to the speed of the embryo in time. Um, and that there was physical damage to the chromosomes as a result. We had a, a similar drop in efficiency with nuclei taken from later stages in sheep, but we and others have been able to produce adult clones from adults. There are clones from about 10 different species now, I think. The striking exception is primates. Um, there, are, there are certainly very, very few clones from adult primates. There may be one or two, but very few. <coughs> 
And again, it's believed to be because of differences in the cell cycle in the early embryo or in the uh, cells taken from adult tissues in primates. And so that the systems are not able to compensate for one another and, and to produce a new embryo. So at the same sort of time that the research with nuclear transfer was going on, there was a different approach being used to understand the control of development. People had begun to identify groups of, of transcription factors and were beginning to investigate their potential. What could they do? Now, for those of you who are not familiar with them, transcription factors are a particular group of proteins, each produced by a gene, and the transcription factors from one gene controls the function of others. Whereas many proteins that are produced are structural proteins for the cell or have a particular function in metabolism within the cell, transcription factors are unique in having the function of regulating the function of other genes. So the question that people began to ask was, if you introduce transcription from factors from one tissue, could they influence that into a different cell type, could they influence the development of that second cell type? And the first and classic demonstration was taking a transcription factor which is critical for muscle development, known as MyoD. Um, if it was introduced into skin cells, what happened? And the answer was that they were changed into muscle uh, fibers. So a single protein was able to make the change from a skin cell to a muscle fiber. On the other hand, if they put in the same transcription factor into hepatocytes from the liver, that change did not take place. Now, skin cells are relatively similar to muscle cells in their development. And so it was seemed as if they could make small changes from within the same lineage, but single transcription factors could not make a change from one lineage across to another totally different one. And so the sort of consensus in the scientific community in 1990 was, okay, so we can make some changes, but the effects are rather limited. Why is that? As I've already indicated, there were other reasons to think that almost all cells have exactly the same DNA. There are one or two exceptions, but very rare exceptions. But the, the mechanisms that control development, which make a cell become a muscle cell or hepatocyte, are complex and rigidly fixed, and so that it was impossible or very, very difficult to change them. And this was the reason why you couldn't change lineages with single transcription factors, and there were no adult clones. But at that time, it was certainly strongly believed, it would have been in the, the standard zoology, biology textbooks, that cloning adults was, was not possible. And this, of course, is the reason why Dolly was such a scientific surprise. She was also a social surprise because there was the prospect being held out that it might be possible to clone people. And that, of course, was the reason for all the television cameras and newspapers. But it was as big a surprise to the scientific community. And the reason's been indicated already that what they showed was that if you took the genetic information from a cell from mammary tissue and put it into an egg, Unknown factors in the egg could so change, and the jargon word we use is reprogram. Think of computing and programming computers. What we're doing is reprogramming the functioning of that genetic information so that it was capable of, of controlling development of an entire new offspring. And it led people to ask, was it possible to find other ways of making this sort of change? Because it was very important that this success was repeated, and some of you may remember that not so many months after we announced Dolly, a group in Hawaii were the first to clone mice, and probably the mouse became the most frequently used test bed uh, for this area of research. Sadly, Dolly contracted a virally induced lung cancer, and there is no treatment for this disease still. There certainly wasn't in those days. And so in the end, when she was six years old, it was kinder to end her life rather than have her 
uh, suffer the death due to suffocation because of the presence of the rapidly growing cancer in her lungs. So, the overall conclusion from this evidence and lots of others is that essentially all cells have the same DNA and there is the excitement that cell function can be modified but only inefficiently. Our objective of being able to make genetic changes in livestock has indeed been achieved by several groups uh, to produce proteins needed to treat human disease and for research purposes. Some of my former colleagues at Roslyn Institute are now working to make livestock resistant to infection. And for example, if it, if it is possible at some time to make farm animals resistant to foot and mouth disease, that would be a huge advantage to all of us and avoid, avoid any more of those horrible outbreaks. But as I've already indicated, by far the biggest impact of the Dolly experiment was to make biologists think differently and to ask this question, can we find other ways of changing cells? And to deal with this subject, I need to introduce the concept of stem cells and to ask the question, what is stem cells? What are stem cells? What's the characteristic of them? And the answer is represented in this diagram in that stem cells have the ability when they grow and divide to produce more cells like themselves on the left, but also giving rise to different daughter cells. So that if you think of a, of a tissue which is growing as you grow up as a fetus or even after birth, increasing the volume of muscle, for example, there may well be stem cells in that tissue which can give rise to more cells like themselves in order to maintain that population of stem cells, but also giving rise to, to more muscle fibers. And this goes on throughout, uh, throughout the body. So this is vital, this function of stem cells is vital during development, but it's also vital for normal health after birth. Strikingly in the blood system, there are millions of cells produced every day in order to replenish the red blood cells and all of the different populations of white blood cells because they have a relatively limited lifespan. Perhaps most strikingly of all, uh, millions of cells are shed from our skin and replaced every day. Um, this is because there are stem cells in there which are capable of doing that. So, until relatively recently, you could divide stem cells into two types. Some uh, produce from particular tissues of adults, and of course the unique cells produce from embryos, embryo stem cells. And if you're thinking of using stem cells for therapy by transplantation, you need to begin to think about the traits that you are looking for, the traits that you'll need, and which of these cells will meet those characteristics. Is it easy to get cells to match an individual? Yes, if you take cells from them, if you use, use a tissue or an adult stem cell. And that, of course, happens a lot with bone marrow cells. It happens a lot if people grow out uh, replacement skin, if somebody is damaged by a burn. It's very difficult to get a match with embryo stem cells because they're not like either of the parents who have contributed to the formation of that embryo, nor to anybody else, or many other people, it's perhaps safer. So it's difficult to get an immune match if you're working with embryo stem cells. On the other hand, in general terms, stem cells from particular tissues have a relatively limited ability to grow in culture. So you can't get very large numbers of them from a, a single starting population, whereas with embryo stem cells you can. The characteristic of them is that if you treat them correctly, they will grow for a very long time to give rise to millions of identical cells which retain the ability to form all of the cells of the body. So the next question, can you get different cell types? With adult tissue uh, cells, there is very limited ability of them to form a different tissue type. They will produce the cells of the tissue from which they came, but nothing else. Whereas embryo stem cells have the ability to form every tissue type. But there is, herein lies the risk, 
is in that because they have this ability to grow and form different tissues, they also have the ability to form tumors. So if you inadvertently introduce embryo stem cells into a patient along with the cells of the right tissue, there is a risk of forming a tumor. And almost certainly, it's this anxiety which has delayed the, the occurrence of cell therapy from embryo stem cells. I'm sure many of you know that in the United States, the Geron Corporation put in an application to use embryo stem cells to produce nerve cells to be used in the repair of spinal cord injury. And it's in the public domain that they, in order to do this, they submitted 20,000 pages of data. Just think of it, you, those of you who are carrying out experiments and writing up a couple of pages of notes. 20,000 pages of data. Now, I don't know, but my guess would be that around about half of that was saying that they did not have contamination with any more pluripotent cells. And the other half would have been saying that they did achieve the beneficial effect that they were looking for. Uh, but the anxiety of forming tumors would have been a major concern. By contrast, cells taken from adult tissues cannot form tumors in this, this way. So although adult tissue stem cells are in a sense safer, they have much less potential uh, benefit. All this has changed because of the fact that lots of people began to ask the question, is it possible to change cells? Dolly has shown that at least eggs can change the functioning of cells. Could we find other ways of doing this? In particular, it won't surprise you that people began to use these transcription factors to see if they could change cells. And the first experiment, and I personally think this will, it's certainly been one of the most important experiments of the first decade of this century. I think if there are people sitting in this university 100 years from now, they're likely to think that it was one of the most important experiments of this century uh, because it has opened up so many opportunities. What Shinya and his colleague did was to identify more than 20 transcription factors which were known either to be essential for maintenance of embryo stem cells or to be present at very high concentration or only to be present in stem cells even if they weren't essential. And they put each one of them in to skin cells of the mouse separately, and none of them was able to reprogram the cells to pluripotency. They also put in all 22, 24, I've forgotten the exact number, and the entire population together could reprogram. So then he set about eliminating factors one by one until he came down to these final four. And it's this group of four here, don't worry about the jargon name, names. Um, it's these four factors which are capable of ch changing skin cells taken from mouse or the same method works with human and turning a small proportion of them into cells equi equivalent to embryo stem cells, so they're said to be pluripotent, and they've been induced by transcription factors, so they're known as induced pluripotent cells or the acronym IPS cells. What people then began to move on to think about was, well, it had been shown that this was possible to change to pluripotent cells. Is it possible to change them to other tissue types? So they started with the same type of skin cell and put in transcription factors which are specific to a particular tissue type and asked, is it possible to get that tissue type? And the answer is yes. So just to give you two examples, skin cells were changed into heart muscle cells by using transcription factors which are present in heart muscle tissue or into neurons by using transcription factors which are normally present in neurons. And they showed, they and others have shown that these cells could integrate into and function normally in mice. So in other words, they're physiologically normal and healthy. It was also possible, instead of going all of the way through to a differentiated cell type, to go to a, an intermediary stage, progenitor cells, these are kind of like a junior stem cell. They have a, a limited ability to multiply and to produce perhaps one or two different cell types. And, and they're present on the path of differentiation from the embryo through to the terminally differentiated cell. So these may prove to be useful to use for therapy, 
because they would go into the same tissue, but if they don't form tumours, um, that, that danger at least may be avoided. There's a careless tendency to think that if you've not got that abnormality, then maybe there are no abnormalities, and I think that's misleading. It could be that a progenitor would give, give rise to cells in a different way, or that they would integrate into the, if it was a, a neural progenitor, that it would integrate into the neural circuitry in an inappropriate way. So, so just because they wouldn't form tumours doesn't mean to say that there wouldn't be any risk in using these cells. So I want to spend the rest of the talk demonstrating to you the way in which reprogrammed cells can be used. And the first use, which is already mentioned, is to look for drugs that are able to prevent the development of the symptom of diseases like motor neuron disease. So in the United States, they call it amyotropic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. So some of the slides may have that acronym instead of MND. Because we're beginning to believe that these cells could be used in cell therapy, I want to discuss with you a strategy which has been suggested by a number of groups, including one in Cambridge, that it may be possible to have an effective library of cells for use in therapy with a very relatively small number. So the 150 lines would give a useful library for more than 90% of the British population. And, and surely it would be possible for a country the size of ours to produce a library of 150 uh, lines. I'm not going to um, say any more about this last potential use, so I'll just say a little bit more about it now. It may be possible to use this as a way of correcting genetic errors in some tissues in people in that if they have a genetic error in, let's say, the hemopoietic system, which you can easily put back into the patient, it may be possible to take a skin cell from this person to produce IPS cells so you can grow as many as you want, and then to use the modern molecular techniques to correct the mutation before you differentiate those cells into a hemopoietic stem cell and put that back into the patient. Because it would be essentially the same as the patient, it should be accepted without any immune rejection unless the correction leads to the production of a different uh, cell surface protein. But it would not have the error, and so it would correct that disease. A key part to this in practice is that you must be able to put the tissue back. I think the most common mutation in Caucasians is cyst causes cystic fibrosis, which causes damage in the lungs and in the digestive tract. It clearly wouldn't be nearly so easy to put cells back throughout the lungs or the digestive tract. But I rather imagine that people will try to see whether this offers any uh, potential benefit. But this would not introduce genetic change into the germline. To, to try to do that, certainly with our current technology, would be rather dangerous. And, and I think to be avoided for the foreseeable future. But this wouldn't do that. This would be making change once the cells were in a dish into cells which wouldn't have the ability to form germ cells. They would only have the ability to form certain tissues. So motor neuron disease. This is the same lady. I may not be able to see your response, but does anybody in the room have a relative who has motor neuron disease? If you have, can you speak up? Good. I'm very pleased for us all. It's inherited in about 5% of cases, which means, in other words, that in 95%, it's probably a mutation which occurs in that new individual and then would be passed on to their children if, if they uh, reproduce and are unlucky. But only 5% is it coming down through families. And what happens is that people begin to notice that they're losing control of limbs. Sometimes it's arms and sometimes it's legs. And my understanding is that there isn't a very clear diagnostic for this disease. Doctors will look for everything else, and if it isn't everything else, then it's probably motor neuron disease. It's very, very difficult to diagnose accurately, unless, of course, the person has one of these mutations, when it's possible to find that and have a categorical diagnosis. It's a family of different diseases with mutations in at least nine genes being associated with the disease. So the next sentence says that typically symptoms appear at the age mid-40s, 
but some of you will recognize that the British astronomer Stephen Hawking has one of these diseases and you will know that he developed the symptoms when he was 20 and he's now 60. Uh, so clearly he's an unusual patient um, and it's representative of the fact that it's a family of different diseases. The way in which these mutations cause the death of the motor neurons is not known and there is no treatment. Just imagine, most of you are younger than 40, just imagine getting to be 40 and being told within about four years you're going to suffocate. Because that's what it means. I, I literally can't think of a worse diagnosis. I think that's worse than cancer, personally. I don't want either, but it's, I think it's horrible. So anything we can do to understand this disease and make a treatment is, would, I think, be really beneficial. So the first thing we have to try and do is to find out what's going wrong in these cells. Until now, on, the only things available to researchers have been to take tissue with permission, of course, from somebody who's died of this disease. But by then, they'll have had these symptoms for four or five years, so there'll probably be lots of secondary effects. And knowing exactly what the primary mechanism is, is very difficult. If you introduce the mutations into animals, and this was done with the first gene to be recognized, SOD1, then you can get some representation of the symptoms in animals. But we're not actually mice. So it wouldn't be a surprise if there were important differences. What the iPS cells offer is large numbers of human cells which have this genetic error for the first time. And so a number of groups, including ours, have taken cells with permission from somebody who inherited this through a mutation in a gene called TDP43. Now, I emphasize that this is a family of different diseases, but it was found about 10 years ago now that in more than 90% of cases, there were abnormal accumulations of this protein, TDP43, regardless of whether or not there was a mutation in that gene. So that leads you to think, well, maybe that protein is involved in the disease, even if the mutation is in one of the other genes. And so that's the reason why we chose that gene to study, in the hope that if we can understand how it causes the disease, that same mechanism may be involved in at least some of the other uh, effects of, of different genes. Now this is another international collaboration, just to emphasize how international uh, research is and how important collaboration is. That the clinician who found the patient is Chris Shaw, based in King's College in London. A colleague of mine, Siddharth and Chandran in Edinburgh, has the technology to produce motor neurons and astrocytes. This work started very soon after Shinya Yamanaka's paper, and we were not making iPS cells, so we collaborated with um, George Daly in Boston, in the United States. And I'm going to show you a technique um, which was developed in San Francisco, which was critical for the ease of this project, uh, with a different collaborator, Steve Fink, by now. And Tom Maniatis, the very, almost the founder of molecular biology techniques, uh, is also involved in the project, although I'm not going to show you any of his data. There are a lot of observations made to see whether the cells in a dish had these same abnormal distributions of protein. And I'm not going to show you that information, I'm just going to say simply that most of them were represented in the labs uh, cells being cultured in the lab. But most strikingly what we wanted to know was did the cells survive equally well if they were cultured for a period of time? And we used a marker, um, HB9 is a gene which is present and functional in motor neuron disease. We used the regulatory elements from this gene to drive the production of a fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein, so that we knew that the cells were motor neurons if they expressed that protein. And what, was, what happened in these experiments is that um, the microscope looked to see if the cells still had the fluorescence. And you can see at the beginning here, there are a number of these neurons which are fluorescing and bright. By the end of the incubation period, there's only one. So what we were observing in 10, 14 days with this single cell analysis was that there was an increased death of motor neurons from the patients. 
And these were represented as a plot of the risk of death. So the red line, which is the cells which were uh, carrying the mutation, this is the uh, representation of the mutation, were more likely to die. And there was a significant difference in a little more than a week. So the blue ones are cells taken, derived from cells taken from a, a healthy person of the same age. And the red line is cells taken from the person who carried this mutation. So this was repeated um, with a number of different clones from this individual. Uh, and the same effect was, was seen consistently. So we also wanted to know astrocytes are what you could think of as neighbor supporting cells in the nervous system. Were they affected? Did they have an increased risk of death? And you could see exactly the same sort of effect, that the cells were much more likely to die during this period of culture if they were carrying the mutation. And again, this was a repeatable effect. All of this has been published in two papers in PNAS in the last two, two years. Um, if you remember, those of you who are interested, my email address was on the front of this talk, but if you look up Wilmot Shaw Finkbeiner in the Google system, uh, that paper is almost certainly to be one of the papers describing this research. Now, there was evidence from the work with SOD1 that the, mo that the astrocytes reduced the survival of the motor neurons still further. They had a harmful effect so that if you co-incubated astrocytes and motor neurons carrying the mutation, the death was even quicker. Now, I'm not showing you the data for this, but when we co-cultured astrocytes carrying the mutation with either normal or diseased motor neurons, there was no effect on the survival under any of these circumstances. So there was no evidence of neighboring effects. So this is very exciting. What we're seeing is something which can be used as a test system to see whether we can find medicines which are able to maintain the survival of these cells in culture. But it's important to point out one or two limitations to the technique, to the experiment so far, uh, and things that we need to do. I mentioned that we had cells from one patient. So all of this has been done with cells from one person. So it may be a characteristic of his cells rather than of the mutation. So you won't be surprised that we are right now repeating this with cells taken from other, other patients. There are a number of other genes that may well be involved in this mechanism, one of which has this acronym of FUS, also involved in the same sort of thing that TDP43 does inside the cell. So should, we should study those and see if there are interactions between these different genes. But even so, although it's, it is essential that we do this, and it's essential that we bear these limitations in mind, you wouldn't be surprised if we were already beginning to use these cells to look for small molecules which can increase um, the survival of, of these cells. So what I hope I've shown you with this one example is that iPS cells offer unique advantages for looking at the mechanisms by which inherited diseases cause the death of cells. You don't actually have to know the mutation as long as you know or it's virtually certain that the mutation is being passed from one individual to another in the next generation. You could, you could look without knowing the mutation. It's also possible to look to see why members of a family who have all got the same mutation, which we can now show quite easily, don't all develop the same symptoms. I personally don't know whether that applies to the effects of TDB43, but it certainly does to SOD1. Not everybody who gets mutations in SOD1 will have the disease symptoms. So that probably means that in the lucky individual, there is some genetic difference which is offering a protection so we could begin to look in that person's cells for the mechanism which is offering protection because that may give us another lead as a way of being able to treat the disease. And the other advantage of these iPS cells, of course, is that they are readily obtained. If a person is willing to give you cells either from the blood or from the skin or the most common tissues, then within two months you can have 
thousands of these cells with this unique potential. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, there is a chance at least that these inherited cases will sometimes be relevant to the sporadic cases so that a drug identified with the cells with the mutation in TDP43 may be useful for others. I'll have to wait and see. Now, I guess many people in this room will recognize that as well as motor neuron disease, there are inherited cases of many others, Parkinson's, psychiatric diseases, some forms of, of learning difficulty. In fact, there are hundreds of inherited disease. I put this up specifically to make that point. This is a page taken from the website of the National Institute of Health in the United States. And each of these vertical dark blue lines is a human chromosome. And each of these horizontal lines is the locus of a site which is believed to be the site of an inherited human disease. So this fog, this gray fog, is showing you just how many inherited diseases there are. There are hundreds, probably approaching a thousand. Some of them are mercifully very rare. Um, not all of them are very serious, but some of them certainly are horrible. And if you think what's involved, some cells from the patients, some skilled tissue culture for a couple of months, and then the ability to produce the cell type which is affected, and then being able to compare them with cells from a healthy individual, it's really not a huge amount of money. And so it should be possible for patient support groups in many cases, to raise the funding which is necessary to study the particular disease which is affecting that group and to begin to tackle these inherited diseases effectively for the first time. So the last thing I want to talk about concerns the ideas of cell therapy using iPS cells. It's ideal if you're able to transplant immunologically matched cells because then there won't be any immune rejection. And in many cases, of course, people are trying to take cells from the patient, autologous cells, and use them because of their compatibility or very close relative. Sometimes this isn't necessary because of autoimmune diseases. So that diabetes, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and if you put back the same cells, they'll be destroyed just as quickly as the originals. Um, and there are other autoimmune diseases. There are some immune privilege sites where there isn't an immune reaction. So, so this isn't always necessary, but in the great majority of cases, it is important to avoid immune rejection. And people initially thought that iPS cells would be patient-specific, so that each person would have their own cells produced, but that would be horrendously expensive. And so groups of people are being developed are developing an alternative approach. And I need to introduce the idea of the major genes which are responsible for immune rejection, the HLA types. Um, now, there are several of these major genes. What I've represented in this and the next slide is the case if there is one gene which has got four different forms, four different alleles. Now, we each have two copies of the gene and usually they'll be different. So in this individual, there's a red and a yellow, green and blue, green and yellow, red and blue. These are all, all different. If you took cells from any of these hypothetical people and put them into any of the others, they would be rejected because there is a major difference. There would be a major difference in every case. But the next slide is going to show you two different ways of providing an immuno immunological match for this patient shown on the left here. One way is to have some of the patient's own cells, put them back, because there there'll be an immunological match. But if you had somebody who had two forms of the red, two copies of the red form of the disease, they would be an immunological match. Two forms of the yellow would be an immunological match. Now there are really three major genes that you need to account for, so it's not nearly as, as easy as this looks. But what a number of different groups have done is to estimate how many individuals it would be necessary to find in order to have people who are homozygous, as these individuals on the right here are called, 
homozygous at these major antigens in order to provide a useful match to all of the rest of the population. And there's a paper in Cell Stem Cell with Craig Taylor from Cambridge, Addenbrooke's Hospital, as the first author, which is probably the most de detailed calculation. He published a, a shorter paper um, a year earlier, two, two, perhaps two years earlier. So what he's calculated is that if they're carefully selected, 150 of these homozygous HLA types individuals would provide an effective partial match for more than 90% of the UK population, which is of course 60 million or thereabouts. So whereas if you were going for individual patient-specific cell lines, you could end up producing a few tens of millions of cell lines. You could get a useful partial max with just 150. Similar calculations have been done in a number of different countries. Um, the number you need tends to depend upon uh, community. Africa is extremely variable, so you need more there. And whether or not a country has been open to immigrants or not. There was a time when Japan was a very close country, so you need fewer cell lines to provide the same match in Japan because there's less uh, variation. So, in summarizing this, and just adding this extra column onto the table that you saw before, it is possible using this approach to get at least a partial match for most people. You can produce very large numbers of cells, you can produce different cell types, but there is this one remaining disadvantage that they would have the ability to form tumors. Fortunately, people are coming forward with techniques for removing pluripotent cells from mixed populations. So this is being addressed in different ways. So there are a group of us drawn from around the world, but coordinated uh, by two of us in Edinburgh, which are developing this as a proposed strategy, that we should work together to identify the most valuable donors and establish a bank of the starting cells um, likely to be either skin or blood, at clinical grade, with all that that involves, and prepare IPS cells. In some cases, you may need to treat the damaged tissue urgently. We certainly used to think that about spinal cord injury, that the treatment was best done within a, within a week. There was a, a short window within the first week. I'm not sure if that's still believed to be the case, but if it is, you won't be able to do that unless you've differentiated these already. Uh, because it would take several weeks to get the neurons that you would need. And we also argue that this resource should be shared internationally. Now, as well as the biology, there is some politics involved here, in that countries tend to draw up different regulations. There'll be slight differences between the regulations here, perhaps, and in the United States, or Japan, or China. And it may then be difficult to move cells from one country to the other. So it, it could be that a clinician in this room in a few years might find themselves with a patient who knows that there are suitable cells in the United States, but the regulatory authorities won't let the cells come into this country. So there's an obvious, if difficult, solution to that. We should now all be working to agree the same regulations. Now, when we say regulations, we mean all of the way through the producing of these cells, the ethical consent with which the person gives the cells, the way in which they are obtained from that person, the way in which they're stored, the way in which they're turned into IPS cells, the, the selection, the quality criteria for the IPS cells, the way in which they're stored, all of the paperwork, because regulators like paperwork. You can tell I'm not a regulator, can't you? Um, the way in which they're differentiated to different tissues, Again, the quality criteria for different tissues would all have to be agreed. But if we can do that, then it may be possible to establish a global haplobank so that perhaps 10 or 20 years from now, everybody in the world could know that somewhere there were pop populations of cells which would give them a useful partial match for cell therapy. So overall, I hope that this suggests to you, many of whom 
hope to become practicing clinicians, that there are going to be a lot of opportunities in regenerative medicine. It's, going to, it's important to point out that it will probably take 50 years, possibly more, for this to reach maturity. If you look back and see how long it's taken to develop antibiotics, immunization, anesthetics, the things which we now take for granted, um, you may think that 50 years is an underestimate. But we should begin to prepare for use of these new techniques now, particularly in the production of cells. It's certainly a time and an area in which international collaboration is very useful. I hope I demonstrated that with our own research. But also for clinical applications for the reason that I've just shown you. If you look back rather more than 100 years actually, we've learned to control and treat and prevent infectious diseases. So really now there isn't any need for anybody in the world to suffer for the infectious diseases that used to kill millions of children every year. I know that the children do still die of these diseases, but that's not for lack of treatment. It's because we can't organize ourselves any better. I think in 50 to 100 years, we could get to the point where the same thing would apply to these degenerative diseases. At the same time as we've learned to control infectious diseases, relatively little has been done to the degenerative diseases. It's now time that together we work together to develop successful treatment for degenerative disease. And I wish you success in that, in your own work. Thank you very much.